We've been trying to analyze samples from these uh, deadly tumors in children and we've actually hit a very unexpected finding that kind of took, uh, took us to, to places we, should, we never thought we would go. We found mutations that are affecting histone genes and histone genes are really the very fundamental unit of our epigenome and the way we kind of fold and unfold our genetic information for it to make sense. And those mutations were really uh, quite key and those are driver and we're trying now to understand what are they doing to kind of uh, animate and, and drive these uh, very deadly tumors. Those mutations have been actually published in Nature in 2012 and we've had subsequent uh, papers on other things. They affect two specific residues within a histone tail, the histone 3 tail. A lysine 27, this is a repressive mark, like the most repressive mark when it's trimethylated and it's changed to a thionine and a lysine 34 that's changed to an arginine or a valine and what we believe is that those mutations are really reshaping the epigenome almost making it like a like the transformer from a car to a monster truck or to Godzilla and it's uh, taking it's really what it is it's it's probably reshaping the epigenome the genome into an architecture that's more like stem cell and making it very uh, intractable to treat. What's very intriguing is that we have more than about, I would say, 20 isoform of, and I'm being very cautious uh, of uh, histone 3, and those mutations seem to occur, whether it's in the, the K27 mutations, occur either in the canonical, but in the non-canonical histone, and they all want to change from a lysine 27 to methionine and they're acting as dominant negative because it's only one of those 20 that's mutated. However, we, we and others have shown that there is absolutely no trimethylation. It abrogates the post-translational modification on the other uh, lysine 27, on other histone 3 that are normally expressed in wild type. I wish we knew. Again, I think, you know, it's, it's part of evolution, Darwin. We're trying to change things. So as we, you know, we, in every single new cell, there is a new mutation. Some, a lot of them are silent and not even carried on. Others potentially gives you a slight advantage. And for some reason, we seem to keep them. And this is, the IDH mutation are exactly, it's, they are the counterpart. And actually, mutation in K, the K27M mutation and the G34 mutation that I've been describing are mutually exclusive with each other and with the IDH mutation. You can't have both of them. And they seem actually to converge on the same thing. Why do, do the IDH mutation happen? We don't know. It's not associated with anything that we yet know is happening, but probably it's, uh, the way our brain or our, our cells have of sampling, what is it that could be of advantage for them? And some are wrongly retained. There are no gene therapies. I wish we could use the CRISPR model or whatever without doing any. It's, it's not happening yet. So if we're still very basic in our way of treating them and we're very, you know, the survival rates are barely 10% and I'm being very generous at three years. So this is, those are still, even if we know a lot about them, we, ha we haven't yet made a dent into how we're managing these tumors. And again, all of those tools, the gene therapy and whatever, are being considered and we're trying to do, to do some stuff, but, but it's not yet happening. For example, uh, what I haven't said that is that in the brain, those mutations in histone, and IDH mutation actually, are always associated with partner mutation that I call partner in crime. We have a recent finding where we showed that the histone mutation occur first, but very fast, like the IDH mutation in order to become tumors, need associated partner in crime. And those partner in crimes are very faithful, meaning when it takes them, it doesn't let go. After that, you'll have other mutations, other alterations that are going to be subclonal and maybe affect the way it grows. But th the first, you know, association are non-random and partners that you need. And in 10%, there is a specific partner that's a kinase. And this partner is found in every single mutated tumor cell. So this one potentially could be amenable to targeting. And there are some people over here that are working on this kinase and trying to design uh, drugs 
And this, for 10% of those patients, when it happens, will be very relevant. So this is the type of information that I try and come and seek even more here. There is another brain tumor that we're, we're not the main people working on it, but we're collaborating very strongly. Why? Because it has a K27 ME3 signature. It's called ependymoma, and those tumors really have no mutation, no alteration. They seem to have the most stable genome. And still, the survival at 10 years is barely 10, 15 percent. And those, you know, it's almost as if something happened that kind of either put the cells in a shape that it should never have, like the prion stuff, or the, uh, it's just they were stuck at the developmental stage that's very early and we need to know based on you know other studies that are trying to look at brain structure and brain development where we don't have this you know the, one of the things that is still missing even it's getting better is the blueprint what is it what to compare to and brain development is very complex many cells many different cells and having the real blueprint is going to be something that's also important in order to understand what are those mutation in those the, the pediatric brain tumor doing they do contain a lot of answers so we've made use of those data like data from encode brain atlas you name it even you know even tcga i think they are uh, they are complementary to many things Every, all data have limits. As long as you understand them and you take advantage of what's there and you try to improve on it, I think there are really things that are very, very precious. We have a paper where we showed in another very embryonal brain tumor. It's actually either a pathway that was present during development that's reawakened or it was stuck at that time. And we only could make it because we had those data available. So what we showed is that there was actually a fusion between a gene that's only expressed in the brain. And we didn't care about the gene because this was a little bit part of it, and microRNAs. And the promoter was the one that was needed because those microRNAs needed expression. And they got the promoter expressed, and then you go and you reawakened a DNMT3B, which is a de novo methyltransferase, that's only exquisitely expressed in between 8 to 12 weeks of gestation and never after. We're using an alternate promoter for this that's only open during 8 to 12 weeks and never after. And those microRNAs usually are only expressed in the placenta between 8 to 12 weeks and never after. So it's all through this brain tumor that either got stuck in time or reverted that we were able. And it's only because we had access to those data that we could make sense of our finding and kind of try and, 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 and understand what was this tumor happening. So yes, those big data are very important. So one of them, the K27M, they die barely within a year of diagnosis. They're very rare exceptions, so please, I need to note that. But the vast majority, I would say 99% die within the year, 18 months. So they are prognostic factors, but we know that those glioblastoma die within, patients die within two to three years. Those ones will do even worse and very fast. For me, the way of seeing a happy ending, I see those patients, I treat them. I have no answer today. But at the very least, I know we're looking in the right direction. Initially, we weren't looking at all there. The epigenome was never to be found. And so the moment you start knowing what is your problem, it's going to happen. I wish it was yesterday, but it's going to happen because with the tools, with the new things, with the collaboration, and this type of meeting is actually quite key to kind of even more strengths and collaboration and open up new ideas.